So, thank you again for the invitation to come here and present some of our recent work. And yeah, so during the workshop, some of you were here during the workshop, I gave an introduction to quantum information science with trapped ions, and today I'll present some uh, very recent research results. Okay, so just to remind you, trapped ions, they are uh, extremely useful in quantum information science, actually full-fledged uh, quantum algorithms have been implemented, very high gate fidelities have been implemented, readout state preparation can be done with fidelities uh, of typically 99.99 and if possibly some more nines, so they work uh, excellently. Quantum simulations have been demonstrated recently with 53 ions even. So they work very well. Now the question is when we want to scale them up to have a real large device, maybe a scalable quantum computer, the way to go is uh, to have integrated microstructured traps. Integrated means uh, these trap chips not only contain electrodes that confine the ions, but also to apply additional fields, for instance, to drive the ions by microwaves or even detectors, photodetectors and light sources. So everything you need on a chip, basically. So there are um, concepts exist to, to do this, and then a uh, scalable quantum computer based on trapped ions is uh, not science fiction, it's science, I would say. Uh, science that has, of course, there's still quite a way to go. Okay, uh, let me point out a few um, proposals for scaling up quantum computers with trapped ions. So the canonical proposal basically uh, is indicated here where you have a let's say a, an ion trap chip with different, those are the yellow things are electrodes and then you can move around your ions between these uh, so-called processor zones where you do quantum logic and then you have memory zones where you store your quantum information. So you have to move around your ions in such a trap chip from interaction zones to memory zones and back and so on. So most of the time actually you spend moving around your ions. So about 99% in concrete proposals you spend moving your ions around. Then there are other uh, proposals, a recent one, uh, where you do have small sub-processors basically and then you can interconnect them via photons, photonic links. So that's an approach that is being pursued in Maryland. And then there's a recent proposal uh, that completely relies only on microwave-driven ions. So there are no more lasers needed for any coherent operation. And so this is a, a small part of a larger trap chip that is uh, proposed for implementing a scalable quantum computer using microwave-driven ions. So that also involves shuttling around ions. So you see these segmented electrodes, which is a sign that you apply time-dependent voltages and then you move your ions around. Okay, so um, and now what I want, you, want to show you today is a few recent experimental results from our group uh, where we looked at, for instance, this shuttling of ions and also a very important aspect which goes under the name of so-called anomalous heating. So I will talk about shuttling of ions, I will talk about this curious phenomenon of anomalous heating and I will show you some recent results with microwave-driven trapped ions. Okay, so this anomalous heating, what is it all about? So ever since people have trapped ions, they observed that the motion of the ions gets heated up uh, very quickly 
And this heating is far beyond anything you expect from, let's say, Johnson noise in your electrodes or something. So this has a, been a phenomenon that has been observed for decades now. And there, is, there are models that can explain it, but there is so far no real experimental evidence, no <coughs> conclusive experimental evidence for uh, explaining this, so that's why the name anomalous, anomalous heating was coined at some point. Let me uh, present just two formula. The rest is uh, formula-free physics. Okay, so let's look at the heating of an ion. So you have a charge and you have fluctuating electric fields. And these fluctuating electric fields, they move around your charge and heat it up eventually. And you can show that the heating rate is well approximated by this expression where you have the charge, the mass of your ion and the harmonic oscillator frequency of your trap. And this SE is the spectral density of your noise, of your electric field noise. Okay, so that's the Im important, uh, so that's the heating rate, that's the spectral density of your noise. And, um, yeah. and I should point out an excellent review article about this topic here is uh, this one. So they compiled all the knowledge that was known up to this point here about this anomalous heating, and it's a rather large article. Okay, and now uh, what is the connection with what I said before? Basically, when we want to have these microstructure traps, we want to, uh, yeah, microstructuring means small structures, so we want to get close to the surfaces, which means the heating rate increases dramatically. That's an experimental observation. And um, it's important to know how it scales exactly, and that's what has been done in this work that I'll present now. Okay, so um, what are the sources of fluctuating electric fields? There are many sources, actually. So there's black body radiation. Um, if you work at room temperatures, that's in many experiments not negligible. But in this case, it is actually. So this is not, uh, this is a theoretical source, but it's uh, orders of magnitude below what you observe typically. Then you have direct electromagnetic interference, so you have all kinds of um, electromagnetic fields floating around in your lab from natural sources, from uh, elementary particles hitting the ionosphere that make fields from, uh, from power lines, so man-made and natural sources uh, that can interfere with your charge, uh, excite your charge. Then you can have electromagnetic pickup, so uh, these fields are induce voltages in some current loop, in some, uh, some loops of um, wires or something that you have in your lab. Then you have this Johnson noise, so uh, just your electrons in your electrodes are, have a certain temperature and they move around um, erratically and so they produce this Johnson noise. Then you have all kinds of technical noise sources from the apparatus that uh, you use to apply voltages to your trap. And you have space charge because you Electrons are emitted from your electrodes and they produce uh, charges that fluctuate also. And then you have so-called patch potentials. So on your electrode, if you have an electrode, it's not a completely homogeneous surface typically, but it's, uh, you find patches, so little islands of uh, where you have a certain voltage and then you have a, a another island that might have a slightly different voltage due to crystalline structures or adsorbances on the surface. So there are many possible reasons. And if you look at how they scale, so 
theoretical models exist, and it's a reasonable as assumption first to assume that uh, this electric noise density is proportional to the frequency of your trap with some exponent to the distance between charge and trap with some exponent and to the temperature. And what I want to concentrate on here is uh, this beta thing here. So how does the electric uh, noise density scale with the distance to the trap uh, electrodes? And you see that uh, you have all these different exponents here in a certain regime. It doesn't have to be a power law necessarily, but yeah, we'll see. And you can distinguish them by their exponents and also by this alpha exponent. You can distinguish these different types of noise. And now this is a very impressive plot done by these people here. So it compiles the knowledge about anomalous heating from experiments over quite a few decades. So what you see is you see the spectral noise density as a function of the distance between ions and trap electrodes. And do you see any law here? It's difficult. So the shaded area, actually this is a power law, uh, 1 over d to the fourth power. And these dashed lines, that's 1 over d to the second power. And looking at this, anything goes, basically. So this is uh, not really useful evidence for any of these scaling laws. So, and the reason for that is simply that you have so many parameters that are relevant in determining this heating rate. So first of all, of course, this distance, then the geometry of your trap, very different traps exist, the material of your trap, your driving electronics. And so this all varies in these experiments, and so a real conclusion is not really possible. With the exception of two experiments, uh, so this one, uh, 16, if you look for 16 on this plot, you find 16A, 16B, C, D, E. So here you actually see a, a, a dependence that was done in a single trap. But the thing is, this was a so-called needle trap. So it's, uh, it's just two needles that form the electrodes. And then you change the distance between these needles. And this is, um, so there are geometrical factors involved in interpreting these results, which are not uh, completely obvious how to deal with them. So that's, um, yeah. And then there's a recent experiment also uh, where this was systematically investigated, this distance scaling, but again, the geometrical factors play a very dominant role in these experiments. What is the trap size for your scalable section? Equal trap size? Uh, so typical trap sizes, electron, electrode sizes are in this region here. Okay, so, um, so this anomalous heating is not well understood from the uh, experimental point of view and also from the theoretical point of view. So, um, and the experiment I'm I'm going to present now is, uh, so we use a very simple structure, basically a plane surface, and we have one ion sitting above this plane surface, and then the only thing we vary is the distance between the ion and the surface, and all other parameters are kept constant. So that should give you some uh, conclusive statements, hopefully, yes, and it did, uh, as you will see in a minute. Okay, and um, so our trap is a generic five electrode surface trap. So this is a picture of the, um, of the trap chip and this is a zoom in of these five electrodes. So you have one electrode, two, three, four, five basically 
there are some special features here, but I'm not going to talk about them. The central electrode is about 150 micrometers wide. And this determines usually the distance also between ion and surface. So the width of your electrodes is typically equal to the distance of the ion from the surface in a typical operating regime of a trap. And our guinea pig is ytterbium ions. So this trap works very well. Um, so this is, uh, this is a time scale, actually. So here you see one ion in the trap, two, three, four, and so on. And you keep them, can keep them for many hours. So it's a trap that works well. And now the important thing is we want to change the distance between the ion and the trap. And there's an experimental trick that is applied here, which is uh, not completely trivial. Um, so you have these five electrodes of your trap that make your trapping potential. And see a happy ion here. So it's trapped. And um, so this is the typical configuration. And here you see the, uh, the vertical potential above the surface as a function of the distance. So you have this minimum here. That's where the ion sits. And so that's the typical, uh, the usual trap operation. But what you can do, you can apply an additional radio frequency voltage to your central electrode instead of this ground voltage. And this has to be in phase with the rest. And, yeah. and then you can actually change the distance, the trapping height distance. So here you see this has been changed from about 150 micrometers to about 60 micrometers. And by implementing this in the experiment, we can change the trapping height in this region here and then uh, observe how the heating changes. Okay, and so this is this is our guinea pig. Uh, we drive an electric dipole transition uh, where we cool and detect fluorescence, and then we have this three pump laser that keeps the ion in this closed cycle. Okay, and now how do we measure the heating rate? We let we turn the heating, uh, the cooling laser, we turn it off, which means the ion starts to heat up. And then um, at some point, we open the cooling laser again, and we observe the spatial extension of the ion in its harmonic trapping potential. And this would be, in principle, be sufficient to do a heating rate measurement. So, and then we vary the time during which we let the ion heat up. And then we get, uh, and from, from the extension of this, um, of this image here, we can deduce the temperature. So we, have, so we get a rate, a heating rate temperature per time. But actually, what we do here is we measure this in a time-resolved way. So we have a certain heat up time. Then we start to cool down again. And then we observe this cooling down process, how this, the spatial extension of the ion in its harmonic oscillator potential shrinks down again. So this is a highly excited ion. And then it, the temperature is reduced. Okay, and to analyze this, uh, we plot the width of this Gaussian function. So it's a harmonic oscillator has a Gaussian uh, distribution in space. So we plot the width at uh, a certain time, and at a second time, and a third time. And so we do this for many times, and then we can fit this data and find the time at zero. So that's where we turn on the cooling laser, and that's where we want to know how hot is the ion at this point. And then we can extract the average vibrational energy simply from the width of these Gaussians. So that's the width of the Gaussian, and that's the energy. Okay, and 
Uh, now I'll jump right to the results. So um, we measure the heating rate as a function of the trap frequency and we find this exponent here. And then we measure the heating rate as a function of the trapping height. And this is uh, a unique thing that has never done before, even though this has been around this anomalous heating for decades now. So, and here we measure this exponent, uh, minus 3.79. And now if you look at all the models that uh, are around, yeah. Oops, oi, sorry. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is H, sorry. Thank you very much for pointing this out. <laughs> you have not sent the slides yet. See, that's why I did it, to wait for your input. <clears throat> okay, um, yeah, so D, oh, actually that's called H here, yeah, so H to, the, to this power. Yeah, that's important, of course. Omega was in this slide, okay. Okay, so now uh, this thing here is, yeah, we did basically this experiment and the conclusion now is uh, it's clearly a power law that we observe and we observe this exponent and uh, you saw before in the introduction the, this alpha minus 4 that uh, comes out of some of the models and this is uh, close to these models, not, yeah, it's compatible with these models here. And uh, if you now, so all these models have a different combination of scaling of, with distance and with frequency. And if you now look what matches the scaling that we observed here, then uh, you see that the model of these patch potentials, that fits nicely. And also the model of a thin dielectric layer covering the electrode. So, in a typical real experiment, you have, you don't have the, your gold or whatever electrode, but you typically have it covered with some dirt or some other stuff that you don't want. And so, so this, these models, they are consistent with this. Okay, so that's, uh, I think, an important contribution to a long-standing question in ion trap physics and possibly beyond ion traps physics. Okay, and now the second part I'd like to uh, show you about what I mentioned in the beginning, shuttling of ions. So move ions around and if we want to have a scalable quantum computer, the ions have to maintain the, their coherence, their quantum information. And that's also, uh, yeah, okay. So I showed you we can do all these high fidelity operations with many nines, but for some reason the shuttling, the fidelity of the internal states when shuttling the ions has not been, so far not been investigated to this precision to have these many nines. People just stopped at two or three nines, so, um, which is not compatible with these other high fidelity things. So if you do a high fidelity gate with five nines and then you shuttle and you mess everything up during shuttling because you only have two nines or three nines, then that's not uh, satisfactory, of course. So as all the other operations, you need a high fidelity in moving your ions around, especially if you spend most of your time moving ions around. So that then that becomes very important. Okay, you saw the slide, and here and here we definitely need lots of moving around. This probably also will involve some moving around. Okay, so that's, uh, we saw this, and now this has been done with a different trap. This is a three-dimensional Paul trap, a microstructure trap. So you see all these electrodes here, and now we can move around the iron here um, and we move them typically by 280 micrometers, so that's a rather large distance for an ion. Uh, if you think an ion has a diameter, let's say, of an angstrom, and you move it by 280 micrometers, that's like moving 
a human of average size from here to Rome across lots of bumpy roads. And we do this many, many times at uh, about 4,000 times. And then we measure the coherence of the ion uh, using a Ramsey type interferometer measurement. So here you see uh, the Ramsey interference fringes, which tell you something about the coherence of the ion after two shuttling events, and then you see it after 4,000 shuttling events, and you see a slight reduction of the contrast, and then if you uh, extract in a rather intricate procedure, you can extract the fidelity per shuttling, and you find these five nines here, and you see that uh, you, looking at the arrows, this is compatible with one, so this is uh, also works with extremely high fidelity and uh, can certainly be an element of a future scalable quantum computer. Yes, yes. So you have you move the ion from one place in the trap to another place in the trap. Uh, yeah, if the uh, you shouldn't have ions in the way typically. But recently, there have been experiments where ions move around each other also. Yeah. And, and, uh, they do not exactly overlap. That's what I wanted to point out here because uh, so you have a slight reduction of the contrast here. Here you see this between the red and the black curve. And the reduction is due exactly to 4,000 times moving it back and forth. And then you look at the loss of fidelity per move and then that's what you get. Okay, and uh, another thing that's worth mentioning is so these, taking this data involved about 20 million shuttling events and the iron was always there, so we did not lose the iron. So this is a, a reliable way of transporting quantum information. Okay, now um, how much time is left? Four minutes, okay. So uh, some of you already have heard about MAGIC, so magnetic gradient induced coupling, which is uh, an approach that is being pursued in uh, our lab in, and in other labs now um, to get rid of all the laser light and also have some interesting physical new features in the ion trap. And I just want to point out, so we have uh, a string of ions, typically a magnetic gradient applied, and I showed you last week how you can individually address ions and that you get this spin-spin coupling between ions. And then this allows you to get rid of all the lasers. So typically, hyperfine transitions are driven by Raman lasers, and they use lots of optical elements, and these lasers are typically controlled by radio frequency sources, and then you drive your ions, so this is a large detour. So this magic scheme allows you to get rid of all the laser stuff and drive directly the ions um, by using radio frequency sources. So that's a big uh, reduction in complexity of your experiments, and it uh, leads partially to new physics. Okay, so our uh, Qubit is a hyperfine qubit in ytterbium, so this has the simplest possible hyperfine structure, total angular momentum zero and one. And so the one state has three states actually, and then we can uh, put this in a magnetic gradient. So we have our trapped ions, they have all now a different hyperfine splitting, and we can address them in frequency space instead of position space. And this is an example, so we talk to this ion, we do thousands of quantum gates with this ion, and then we observe the crosstalk on all other ions. And we do this for every possible combination of this quantum byte, and then we get this crosstalk matrix here, 
of interacting ions and the crosstalk is very small. And so it's below a typical error correction threshold that is uh, typically seen at 10 to the minus 4, but that's a matter of debate, of course. Okay, so that's individual addressing that we can do. Then we can, since we have these three hyperfine states here with uh, different dependencies on the magnetic fields, no dependency, uh, positive and negative scaling with the magnetic field of the energy, uh, we can also have so-called processor qubits, so we need uh, magnetic field dependence to have an interaction. And we want no magnetic field dependence for, uh, for storage of uh, quantum information. So by having a, a stationary string of ions, we can simply recode our qubit and go from a storage qubit to a processor qubit and vice versa. And this uh, I want to demonstrate using three ions, so that's now three qubits, and I uh, symbolize them by these spins here. And just to make it more clear, the picture, we put them not in a straight line, but uh, like this. And then you have these couplings, these mutual spin-spin couplings. And um, yeah. So now to show you that we can have in a string of three ions simultaneously a memory qubit and a processor qubit, I'll, I'll show you this data here. So we look at ion i, ion 1. And we look at the phase shift as a function of time, the phase shift of this spin here as a function of time, depending on the states of the other qubits. So we flip the state of qubit 3, and we don't see any phase shift on ion 1. And here we flip the state of qubit 3 and observe the phase shift on ion 2, so that there's a clear dependence. So we can do conditional quantum dynamics and memories at the same time having a stationary string of ions. So we do not even have to move this here. But we can also couple them all simultaneously. So all couplings are on at the same time. And now we look at qubit 2, how it, uh, its phase is shifted as a function of the state of qubit 1 and 3. So you see both qubits 1 and 3 in state 0, you get this phase shift of qubit 2. Then you look at this combination of 1 and 3, and you get this phase shift. And then you have these two other combinations. You get no phase shift. So here you can see that the phase of this qubit de depend, the phase of this qubit depends simultaneously on the state of the other qubit. So you have a simultaneous interaction. OK, and we, you can even change the sign of the coupling by changing your basis. So, so if I use this basis, for instance, I get, and then I measure the coupling matrix, I get such a matrix here. And now I change this qubit to this basis, and then I get these minus signs here all of a sudden. So by simply recoding my qubit, I can uh, change also the coupling constants. OK, and this has been yeah, an important thing is all these operations are done by simple microwave pulses. So in this case, you do not move anything. You, do, you don't have any lasers. All you do is microwave pulses, a stationary string of ions. And, yeah. and this has been uh, used to implement a coherent quantum Fourier transform with all these couplings on. So you have single qubit gates. You have conditional dynamics. That's the important thing here. And then what you can show in the end, uh, we look, since it's a coherent uh, QFT, we have to look at the coherence of each qubit at the output. So we do Ramsey experiments for different input states and compare them to theory. And since we have no time, I don't leave you time to look at these curves, but theory and experiment agree well. And then we can also measure the periods of a certain function. So that's the use of the QFT. And for instance, in Shor's algorithm, this also works fine. So and just to conclude this part, uh, so this is a complete QFT quantum algorithm. 
and this is a single C not gate. And since we use the simultaneous coupling, we can actually do the whole QFT in a time that we otherwise need would need for a single two qubit gate. Okay, so this works very well. And now the outlook, um, yeah, we want to go towards quantum simulations using spins and phonons using this and this scalable quantum computer is on the agenda and this is vigorously pursued by the group of Winnie Hensinger in Sussex actually. Okay, so thank you very, thank you very much. much.